in our number 10 spot we have royal fish. This is one law that came into existence because someone was feeling a little greedy. Since 1327 it has been decreed that all beached whales in the UK belong to the king or queen and we can all thank Edward II for this one. In 1324 he passed a law defining whales, sturgeons, dolphins and porpoises caught within 5 kilometers of the shore as royal fish. These fish collected a lot of money in medieval markets and those who were wealthy wanted these fish for their special feasts and banquets. Of course, instead of purchasing them with your riches, what do you do? Well, you just make up an insane law so that you can steal them, of course. What's even crazier is that this law actually hasn't been repealed, and in 2004 there was a fisherman who caught a 10 foot sturgeon near Wales, and he actually had to ask Queen Elizabeth's permission to sell it. Apparently, she told him that he could use the catch, quote, as he saw fit. In our number 9 spot today we have strange cows. This law is one that was repealed in 1974 because at one point, I'm sure this made a lot of sense, but surely by 1974 and especially by now, it is simply just hilarious. This law is from Texas and it stated that whoever, without the consent of the owner, shall take up, use or milk any cow not his own, faced a $10 fine. How weirdly specific! There was a law and a specific amount of a fine set up just for milking a strange cow. I mean, I feel like I understand why this one is illegal because how strange is it to just milk someone else's cow? A little intrusive if you ask me to be honest. Of course the only reason you'd be milking someone else's cow would be to steal the milk and that is still rude to do now, but back in the day that could have had much heavier implications. Although that specific law was repealed, there is still a law in Texas that is in regards to the same sort of thing. It is still illegal to milk someone else's cow without permission but now you'll be charged with theft and trespassing instead of a flat $10 rate. Also, who wants to be the weirdo stealing milk straight from a cow? In our number 8 spot today we have cold feet. Ok, apparently since 19th century France it's been legal to marry a dead person. Yeah, had to cut right to the chase with this one because beating around the bush simply just didn't seem right. Also known as necromancy, this law dates back to times when being born out of wedlock was a big no no. So say if your husband was to be out at war while you were pregnant and he ended up passing away in the war, this law would help to ensure that your child was born from within a marriage. The consent of the person who passed away could either be given by their family or if there was an existing engagement before they passed. This law still does actually exist in a way with the most current form coming in 1959 after a terrible incident where a dam burst and 423 people lost their lives. One of the most recent examples of this was in 2017 when someone's partner was killed in a terror attack and he was still able to marry his partner posthumously. While this law sounded a little weird in the beginning, I am glad to know that it had some practical and important uses. In our number 7 spot today we have no fun. Since 1966 in Victoria, Australia it has been illegal to fly a kite in a public space if it bothers someone else. You actually can't even play a game in a public space if it's gonna annoy someone else. I really hope you don't have a Karen in the neighborhood I guess or no jump rope for you. This was listed as a part of the Summary Offenses Act but it's crazy that this is something that came into effect as recently as 1966 and not hundreds of years ago. It just seems Seems like such a random rule to instate. And it was way more popular to see these kinds of no fun laws in legislation from centuries ago. Or footloose, I guess. Anyways, all of this aside, I don't think that there are many Aussies who will be upset if you choose to fly a kite on a nice breezy day. In our number 6 spot today we have no UFO parking. After a man in this French winemaking town reported seeing aliens leave in a cigar shaped UFO, the town of Chateau Neuf de Paps made this law as follows. Article 1. The overflight, the landing, and the takeoff of aircraft known as flying saucers or flying cigars, whatever their nationality is, are prohibited on the territory of the community. Article 2. Any aircraft known as flying saucer or flying cigar which should land on the territory of the community will be immediately held in custody. Article 3. The forest officer and the city policeman are in charge, each one in what relates to him, of the execution of this decree. Decree. Not only is this law hilarious, but it's also super effective because they haven't seen any aliens or UFOs since it was passed in 1954. I really do respect them for doing what they can to protect their vineyards, however, but maybe the aliens just want a little wine too. 
In our number 5 spot today we have no gum. You know when some people choose to do something wrong and then it ruins things for everyone who wasn't doing the wrong thing? Yeah, that's what happened in Singapore and now no one can chew gum. There were some people who decided to try and mess with the mass rapid transit system and they used chewing gum to do it. These people ended up costing the housing and development board $150,000 a year just to clean up this gum. So in 1992 they banned it. They banned all gum substances and so anyone importing, selling or making gum can potentially face fines or even jail time. In 2004 however there was an exception made for those who needed gum for therapeutic, dental or nicotine chewing gum reasons and those can be bought from a doctor or pharmacist. I wonder if there's an underground gum ring in Singapore now. In our number 4 spot today we have no high heels. This law is a strange one but it will be no problem for the overpacker in your life. If you're taking a trip to Greece anytime soon make sure you don't pack only high heels because if you do then you won't be able to visit the Acropolis. That's right, in 2009 the country banned wearing high heels there. I really don't know why anyone would want to walk around there in high heels. I mean ruins and dirt don't exactly make me scream stilettos but clearly it was happening enough that a rule needed to be made. This rule, although seemingly random, is actually important. As it turns out, people's sharp shoes may have been damaging the site, and truly that's just not worth it. The ruins are 2,500 years old, so at this point I feel like we can throw on a pair of bands and call it a day. No one needs to wear black tie attire when visiting a historical site. Like, sorry I forgot my ball gown, can I still visit Gobekli Tepe? <laughs> that was a dumb joke. In our number 3 spot today we have Jellicle Cats. In 1939, in what was called, quote, a war measure to alleviate mental strain upon the populace, the town of French Lick Springs, Indiana passed a law that required all black cats to wear bells on Friday the 13th. This would make sure that anyone who heard a cat's bell was able to avoid crossing their path and having bad luck. I honestly feel like I should be making this up, but it's true. I guess I can really appreciate them doing what they can to alleviate the stressors in the lives of those who are having to live through a world war, but it just seems like there's so many other way more stressful parts of a war than black cats on one specific day. Like imagine if we were entering World War 3 and we were like nuclear bunkers and the government was like no but you don't have to worry about black cats anymore. In our number 2 spot today we have Winnie the Pooh. Winnie the Pooh Bear is a well known and loved animated figure but he doesn't wear pants and apparently a pantsless bear is upsetting to some people. Because of this weird issue there's apparently a law in Poland that has banned Winnie the Pooh from playgrounds and schools. I mean wait till they hear about all the pantsless and shirtless bears that are just walking around outside. I'm not sure how they'll be able to keep it together. I'm not exactly sure how far this one can be taken. I mean if your kid has a Winnie the Pooh sticker are they going to be sent to jail? Probably not. I mean even a fine seems a little ridiculous though, right? I don't know. I guess there's a reason I don't make laws. Winnie the Pooh is just a little too risque these days, I guess. In our number 1 spot today we have Footloose. Since we mentioned it all the way back at number 7, let's talk about a very real sort of Footloose situation. This law was instituted in Japan and was enacted in 1948 while US soldiers were occupying. Basically the idea behind it was to stop Americans from corrupting the citizens of Japan and basically dancing in a club after midnight was banned. It is said that dance halls often used to be fronts for other businesses during this time when the nation was poverty stricken. The activity was considered just to sinful, but now since Japan is one of the largest economies in the world with a high standard of living and a vibrant nightlife, the ban was finally lifted in 2015. There is still a rule around post midnight dancing though, it's just slightly more relaxed. You can dance, but once the clock strikes midnight you need to be doing it in a well lit room. I'm not sure what that changes, but what I do know is that when the lights come on after last call, it's time to go. Starting off in our number 10 spot we have the blood eagle. This messed up thing was a ritual method of execution that was detailed in late skaldic poetry. In the two instances where this horrible punishment was mentioned, the victims, who both happened to be members of the royal family, were placed in the prone position. So laying flat on their tummies, they had their ribs severed from their spine using a sharp tool and then they had their lungs pulled out through the opening to create a sort of super messed up, really scary and terrifying pair of wings. Both instances 
instances where this insane punishment is said to have happened, the person was being punished for patricide or for killing their own father. So I guess don't do that? I'm not sure what the takeaway from this one is other than, wow, that sounds horrible. I'm glad we don't do that anymore. I really love my dad. <laughs> In our number nine spot today, we have the pair of anguish. I don't really like regular pairs all that much, but this one definitely sounds like the worst pair probably ever. Like even worse than the one that's got brown spots all over it. The pair of anguish was also known as the choke pair or mouth pair, and I wish we could just stop here and I could let you use your own weird imagination, but we'll keep moseying on through. This torture machine consisted of a metal body that was obviously shaped like a pear normally, but it was divided into different segments and these segments could be spread apart by the simple turning of a screw. So basically this pear would be put into any kind of orifice, like the mouth, and then it would be slowly expanded and you see where this is going. Do I need to continue? All right, we're done number nine. Let's keep rolling along. I'm uncomfortable already. In our number eight spot today, we have the water drip. This one, also referred to as the dripping machine, was a form of mental torture. I know some of these ones that are more psychological don't seem as bad as the horrible forms of physical punishment we've talked about, but that's not necessarily true. This punishment involved cold water, which would slowly be dripped onto a person's scalp, forehead, and face for a prolonged period of time. The pattern of the drops was irregular, and because the water was cold, it was obviously quite jarring, which would cause a person's anxiety to spike as they try and anticipate the next drip. Okay, if this one wasn't gruesome enough for you, let me add one more kind of water punishment in here for good measure. We also have the forced ingestion of water, which is, I mean, exactly that. Forcing someone to drink too much water that they eventually aspirate on it or die from water intoxication, which yes, is a real thing. In our number seven spot today, we have Mazatello. This one was a method of capital punishment that was occasionally used by the Papal States for only some of the most terrible crimes or crimes that were considered especially loathsome. Basically, the person who was being executed would be led to a scaffold that was located in the public square because they didn't have Netflix back then, so instead they just watched people die. I don't know, it was weird. I'll keep watching Nailed It instead. But anyway, the person would be accompanied by a priest and then on this scaffold, there would be a coffin and a masked executioner who was dressed in all black. A prayer would be said for the soul of the condemned, and then when the time came, the executioner would swing a mallet into the air and then bring it down on the head of the prisoner. Sometimes this one blow would be enough to take their lives, and sometimes it would merely render them unconscious, which would then lead to their throat being cut. None of these sound good. This one sucks so bad. I feel bad giving you guys this information. Next video, can it be like top 10 nice, cool, wonderful flowers or something like that? In our number six spot today, we have immurement. This is an unusual form of punishment and boy, it is cruel. Maybe not quite as gruesome and gory as some of the others today, but this one would have been equally, if not more terrifying. How am I to know? Like I said last time, how could I ever rank these in any kind of order? They're all just so bad. <laughs> This is a form of imprisonment that is basically just when a person is sealed within an enclosure that has no exits. While this would surely be a very effective form of psychological torment, this is usually a method that resulted in death. Most instances included people being shut away in small confined spaces such as a coffin, and the prisoner is usually left to pass away from starvation or dehydration. This form of punishment is different from being buried alive because of how the person passes away, since being buried alive usually results in asphyxiation. Okay guys, we're close to being halfway through, we can do it. In our number five spot today, we have necklacing. Suddenly I have a desire to never wear jewelry again after learning about this one. Necklacing is a terrifying practice that involves a rubber tire and unfortunately a human being, obviously. The rubber tire is filled with petrol, which is then put around the victim's chest and arms and then set ablaze. Yeah, what the heck? I feel like I'm describing a terrible, scary mob sort of a movie right now, but sadly I'm just talking about things people have actually done to each other in real life. I mean, I'm sure you can figure out what happens next, but it is said that this method can take up to 20 minutes for someone to pass away from, and they're just left suffering in the meantime. How horrible. Just like everything else on this list, and it only gets worse. Maybe? I don't know about worse, but it definitely doesn't get better. In our number four spot today, we have Molten Metal. Okay, okay, there's gotta be a point where I draw the line, right? 
I guess not, because you weirdos like to hear about these horribly insane punishments, and I'm here to deliver you what you want, so let's dive right into this whole batch of terrible. This absolutely skin-crawling punishment was a form of capital punishment because there is absolutely no way you'd be surviving after this. While gruesome, this punishment has a fairly simple explanation. Basically, they just poured molten metal or super, super hot liquid metal down the throat of the person being executed. I'll tell you what, that'll certainly do the trick. Usually during this punishment, they would do things to ensure that your throat would be open during the pouring of the hot, hot metal, and to that I have to ask, does it matter? That pain would be excruciating no matter what. But hey, people of the past loved a horrifying spectacle, so what am I to do? In our number three spot today, we have impalement. This is another one that was highly requested by you guys, which makes me wonder, who have you been hanging out with? Vlad the Third, also known as Vlad the Impaler or something? Okay, that wasn't funny, but seriously, I'm a little worried about you. Anyway, this was a popular form of punishment for a long time and was most commonly used as a response to crimes against the state, although Mr. Vlad we just mentioned basically just did it to everyone he didn't like, so I suppose to each their own. Impalement was a method of both torture and execution that involved slowly driving a stake or pole or spear or hook or whatever through a person in order to completely or partially perforate the torso. You can impale someone vertically or horizontally if you want to spice it up and don't worry, it'll suck either way. In some situations, the impaled person would then be put on display for others to see. Sometimes this was used as a warning and other times it was just because they could. Isn't history fun? Mr. G never taught me this in grade 10. In our number two spot today, we have drawn and quartered. All right, you guys asked for this one, and I am nothing if not a great listener, so here we go. This was a popular form of punishment and became the statutory penalty for men who were convicted of high treason in the Kingdom of England from 1352, although this form of punishment certainly existed well before that. Basically, whoever the convicted was, they would be secured to some sort of a wooden panel and then drawn by horse to wherever this thing was going down. That wasn't said casually to make light of this horrible punishment, I'm just uncomfy so I'm trying to keep it cool and casual. So once at the place of execution, the person would then be hanged, almost to the point of losing their life, but from there they would be emasculated, for lack of a better term, disemboweled, beheaded, and then quartered or chopped into four pieces. All right, and because this simply wasn't enough for some insane reason, the pieces would then be displayed in prominent places across the country. Like, no, I don't want to see someone's upper right quadrant while I'm going for breakfast. I'll pass on that. Thank you so much, though. In our number one spot today, we have scaphism. All right, you guys, this one is also known as the boats or being eaten alive or really whatever way you swing it, it absolutely sucks so badly. This is an ancient method of execution that involved putting someone sandwiched between two boats that are stacked on top of one another. From here, they'll feed the person and cover them in milk and honey and then just leave them. From here, the substances on and in the person will fester and attract bugs and other small vermin, which will then basically eat that person who can't fend for themselves alive. Not only would being eaten alive be one of the worst ways to go, but this process was incredibly lengthy and ensured the person suffered for a long time. Like we're talking over 10 days here. In one of the first written mentions of scaphism, which comes from Plutarch, while talking about the execution of Mithridates, he said, quote, when the man is manifestly dead, the uppermost boat being taken off, they find his flesh devoured, and swarms of such noisome creatures preying upon, and, as it were, growing to his inwards. In this way, Mithridates, after suffering for 17 days, at last expired. So uh, yeah, anyway, if Plutarch wants to pay for my therapy after that, I think I'd be really grateful. Starting off this countdown, we have death. Now this might seem very weird, but for the longest time, it was illegal to die. Yes, you heard me. This law is said to date back to the Greek island of Delos in the 5th century BC. The island was considered a very holy place to the ancient Greeks, so they decided they needed to purify it. By 6th century BC, all dead bodies buried in sight of the island's main temples were actually dug up and removed. They didn't want any dead bodies near this holy place. Turns out that wasn't enough for them though, and they ended up declaring that all dead bodies on the island must go. Then they got even more carried away and just said that the act of death itself 
was illegal, which is wild to me. Like, what if you accidentally die? Like, how are they gonna arrest you anyways? Like, you're dead at that point, doesn't even matter. But the ancient Greeks were not the only ones with this law. In 2005, the mayor of a Brazilian town introduced a law that made death legal. He implemented this law as an attempt to solve the city's problem with lack of burial spaces. And three towns in France also have this law. They have made death illegal since 2000. And that's because they were going to build more cemeteries, but their plan got rejected. So instead, they're like, Okay, well, if we can't have more space to bury the dead, then just dying is illegal. You can't die. Coming in at number nine, we have the pet hair. Now, America has some pretty strange laws. If you wanna see a video on all the weirdest laws in America, make sure to smash that like button and let me know in the comments below so that I know. Now, in Delaware, you are banned from selling your cat or dog's hair. First off, who is out here buying cat and dog hair? Second, if this is a thing, then dog groomers would be rich. So apparently some people like to wear dog or cat fur, kind of like how people wear rabbit fur jackets. And so I guess there was this whole hair selling ring that they needed to crack down on. According to the law, and I quote, in Delaware, a person is guilty of the unlawful trade in dog or cat byproducts in the second degree if the person knowingly or recklessly sells, barters, or offers for sale or barter the fur or hair of a domestic dog or cat or any product made in whole or in part from the fur or hair of a domestic dog or cat. So don't do it, folks. Your pet poodle might shed a lot, but don't even think about scraping your couch or leggings to get as much hair as possible to sell. In our eighth spot today, we have the sharing of Netflix. Who here actually owns a Netflix account? Versus who here knows someone with a Netflix account that you are using for free? Let me know in the comments below. Now I ask this because in Tennessee, it is illegal to share your Netflix password. That is right. That is an actual law that was passed in 2011. Now apparently this law is mainly directed at hackers who would sell login credentials and passwords to people. But it also applies to the people who let their friends mooch off of their account for free. But if you live in the same household as the person, then it's fine. You're allowed to share accounts. But if you don't, right to jail. In our seventh spot, we have the wild swans. Now I did not know this, but in the UK, Every wild swan technically belongs to the crown. This has been a law since the 12th century. I mean, I don't know why you would wanna put a claim on swans, but okay. Apparently, back in the day, swans were a delicacy and they loved eating them at banquets and feasts, so they put a claim on all swans. But don't worry, allegedly they are no longer eaten. Allegedly. Now, since the swans belong to the crown, this means that anyone who injures or kills a swan can be prosecuted. And if you steal a swan, it's considered theft. In our six spots, we have marry a dead person. The fact that this is a law in the first place, it concerns me. Now, there was a time way back in the day in France where people could marry a corpse, but only if the family members consented to it. For example, if your partner died in battle before you could get married, or if you were pregnant with their child, then you could easily get married to their dead corpse. And by doing so, it would make your child legitimate. But people couldn't just be like, ooh, Nancy's dead, I had a crush on her forever, now I can finally marry her. No, that's not how it worked. In fact, in 1959, there was a spike of people getting married to their dead partners. On December 2nd, 1959, the Malpasse Dam in France burst. As a result, 423 people lost their lives. After that event, tons of people were getting married to their deceased partners. And as recently as 2017, someone married their partner posthumously. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the smiling. In Milan, ever since the 19th century, there has been a law where it is a legal requirement to smile at all times. Even if you're having a bad day, you better be smiling. The only exception being during funerals or hospital visits. Now, I don't know about you, but my cheeks would kill me if I had to smile all day, every day. Now, it is very unlikely for you to get in trouble if you're caught not smiling, but they have handed out fines for it before. Now, you may be asking me, Lindsay, why is this a law in the first place? to make Milan a happier place? No, this law dates back to when Italy was under Austrian rule. They used this law as a way to force people to accept foreign governance. 
They thought the people that weren't smiling were the ones against this, so they were easy to spot. But obviously this rule hasn't been enforced in years. In our fourth spot, we have getting drunk in a pub. I mean, it makes sense that if you go to a pub, maybe you'll have one too many drinks and you get a little drunk. Well, don't even think about doing this in the UK. The UK statute actually prohibits people from getting drunk in a pub, the place where you go to drink. This law applies to pretty much any establishment in England and Wales that isn't private property. It just seems so silly though. You would think a pub is the one place you could get drunk. Now this is an offense under the Criminal Justice Act of 1968. This law states that under section 12 of the 1872 Lysing Act stipulates that every person found drunk on any licensed premises shall be liable to a penalty, which currently stands at 200 pounds. Moving on to number three, we have the runny nose. Now this is another weird law from the UK, this time from Newmarket in Suffolk. Basically, this is the birthplace of horse racing. It was extremely popular in around 1606, and it became a huge business. So big, in fact, that they passed a number of laws to help protect their horses. One of them being making it illegal to blow your nose in the street. They were scared that the racing horses would get sick and not be able to compete and it would damage their business. So yeah, anyone who was caught blowing their nose back then would be fined. Even if you were caught walking around while sick, you were fined. Don't worry, these laws aren't a thing anymore. In our second spot today, we have the criminal animals. Did you know that back in the day, animals could be tried in court for criminal offenses? I literally can't imagine that, like a chicken taking a stand in court because it stole its neighbor's feed, but alas, it was a real law. In the middle ages, people tried animals in court. I kid you not, mice and insects got trials for destroying grain or damaging churches. Whereas larger animals like pigs and horses got trials for injury or murder. If they were found guilty, which they usually were, they can't really defend themselves, they would receive the death sentence. But it's not like they know what murder is or what they're doing. I mean, one time a pig in France killed a youngling and it got hanged for murder. Isn't that wild? Just thank gosh these laws aren't around anymore. And in our number one spot today, we have the pregnant women. Have you ever wanted to get away with murder? And I hope your answer is no, Lindsay, I'm not insane. But if you answered yes, well, it turns out it's pretty easy if you live in New Hampshire. All you gotta do is be a woman and be pregnant. In 2017, New Hampshire passed an anti-homicide law. New Hampshire Senate Bill 66 was all about fetal homicide, saying that a fetus is a person by 20 weeks. So if you accidentally killed this fetus, let's say in a car crash, then you would be punished to the fullest extent of the law. But the law didn't apply to pregnant women who might need an abortion. But somewhere along the line while passing this bill, the words got jumbled and it made it seem like it was legal for pregnant women to murder anyone that they want. So for a brief period of time, they could have killed someone and got away with it. Thankfully, they realized their mistake before this happened. Starting off this countdown, we have the pests. One very important thing to know about Antarctica is that its ecosystem is pretty fragile. This is due to climate change, loss of biodiversity, human impacts, and the accidental introduction of non-native or alien species. Somehow, we as humans have introduced 121 types of fungi, 72 invertebrates, eight mammals, and three bird species. Now, there are even worms in Antarctica. This is why Antarctica has a don't pack a pest rule. This means that before coming to Antarctica, everything you bring must be thoroughly washed, decontaminated, and inspected. This is to make sure you don't got any tiny seeds on you. They'll even hoover you just to make sure. It's pretty intense, but it's done in order to protect Antarctica. Moving on to number nine, we have no souvenirs. So you took a trip to Antarctica and you wanna take something as a memento to remember your trip by. Too bad, you're not allowed to. Taking anything home from Antarctica is banned. That includes a small pebble from a beach or a small bird feather. You can't take any kind of biological material home. Now the reasoning behind this is that there are around 10,000 scientists operating there. They don't want you accidentally taking a fossil home with you or something. You also can't take any equipment you find randomly, even if it's unattended, because chances are 
it's research equipment and that would be stealing. There's no finders keepers rule in Antarctica, sorry. Moving on to number eight, we have the lichen. Believe it or not, but plants do grow in Antarctica. When people think of this continent, they think of it as a cold, barren place, which is fair, but several types of grass, moss, and lichen grow there. One rule that Antarctica has is that you are prohibited from walking on the lichen. Now, it's because that it takes such a long time to grow, and if it gets damaged, it'll take an even longer time to repair itself. And it may not look like much, but it's vital to Antarctica's ecosystem. In our seventh spot, we have the rescue. Now, Antarctica is pretty freaking big. It's twice the size of Australia, and it has the lowest recorded temperature on Earth. Not only that, but there's not a lot of people living there, which is why, if you're in danger, don't expect to be rescued. It sounds depressing, but it's just realistic. And with Antarctica's unpredictable weather conditions, rescues are basically impossible. Tour groups literally will tell you not to stray away. If anything happens to you, you're kind of SOL. This place might be beautiful, but it's harsh and full of unseen dangers. In our sixth spot, we have the no guns law. Antarctica is a demilitarized zone, meaning absolutely no military activity can take place there. This means that there cannot be any military bases or structures of any kind, and absolutely no weapons testing. With that comes the no weapons law. No firearms or explosive devices are allowed there unless you have been given direct permission. Now, officials in Antarctica do have a firearm, but it's locked away in a glass cabinet in the station master's office. It's a 12 gauge shotgun, and it's only used in emergency situations. According to a local, the only time the station master used this gun was when a man was chasing another man around town with a butcher knife shouting something about aliens. The next day, the station master was seen escorting this man, who was placed in a straitjacket, onto a plane to get him out of there. He had his gun with him as protection. Other than him, you're not allowed to have any firearms in your possession. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with the dolphins. Dolphins are cute, right? Maybe you want to go out whale and dolphin watching and you just want to get close to them. Well, don't. There is a rule in Antarctica that states you must leave the dolphins alone. This includes sailing a boat directly into a group of dolphins to try and get them to bow ride with you. Now, they have been known to do this on their own, but it's forbidden to harass these mammals in an attempt to get them to do it. Not only that, but Antarctica is home to hourglass dolphins. These types of dolphins are very rare and not yet threatened, so they want to keep it that way. In our fourth spot today, we have the wisdom teeth removal. Turns out that you gotta get your wisdom teeth removed before going to Antarctica. This is mainly important for people wanting to stay there for a while or those that are going to work there. If you're doing a quick visit, then you don't really gotta worry about this. Now, having your wisdom teeth removed lessens the risk of having a medical emergency since medical aid is very limited there. But not everyone needs to have them removed. You have to undergo rigorous medical and dental exams before going to Antarctica. So if it's found that your wisdom teeth won't be a problem, then you don't have to have them removed. In our third spot, we have the nuclear weapons. Antarctica is a nuclear free zone. You know, just in case you were thinking about bringing a nuclear bomb or something with you, you can't, I'm sorry. On top of that, it cannot be used for testing nuclear weapons. A treaty was made when test explosions were being carried out in the South Pacific. They were scared that Antarctica, being largely deserted, was going to be an area where people also wanted to conduct nuclear testing. But this treaty prohibits them from doing so. You're also not allowed to use Antarctica for the disposal of nuclear waste. Moving on to number two, we have the appendix removal. If you're going to Antarctica for an extended period of time to visit, live, or work there, there's just one tiny little thing you have to cough up. Your appendix. Yeah, you heard me. Anyone there for a long time has to get their appendix removed. Now, this is because the nearest major hospital is 1,000 kilometers away or 625 miles. And there are only a few doctors on base and none are specialist surgeons. So if something goes wrong with your appendix, they won't be able to help you. Now, there are also doctors available in the research bases. Again, none of them are surgeons who can operate on appendixes. Also, let's say 
something severe does happen. Medical evacuations take a lot of time and effort and end up putting everyone else at risk. So they make people get their appendix removed as a preventative measure. And in our number one spot today, we have the jurisdiction. Now the jurisdiction of Antarctica is confusing. And that's because Antarctica doesn't belong to anyone. There is no single country that owns Antarctica. So when you visit, you're under the jurisdiction of your own country. Same with the researchers working there, regardless of which national station they may visit. So when there, you are subjected to the laws of your country. If you break any of the rules of the Antarctic Treaty, you face the laws on that when you return home. Same thing goes if you commit a crime there, you face punishment when you return home. Thank you.